Alright guys, so this week we had a snow day, so we're a little bit behind in class, so I'm going to record the review for the test. You have a paper copy, you're going to go through all the answers on your own, then you're going to bring this up and then just use this to slowly and methodically go through each question, make sure that you are cool and ready for next week's test. Um, I'm going to put it into this playlist right here, Intermediate Instrumentation Labs. Here you've got the textbook, you have that on Blackboard. Um, then you've got uh, Process Control Loop Basics, so if you want to go back over that, we covered that in the beginning of the class, control loop block diagram examples we did. Uh, then we went over the 4 to 20, 1 to 5, and 3 to 15 standardized signals. If you want to watch this and see me as a younger man with hair, um, then you can watch uh, this guy. Um, then we've got a couple extra videos here. What are current to pressure transducers? Uh, which covered our lab here, the current to pressure transducer lab. Uh, we were not able to do the open tank level lab with the uh, the lab volt DP cell. Um, so you, I would say, watch this one. It's a little bit uh, dizzying because I used my uh, my GoPro there. Uh, but that was the lab we were supposed to do for lab three, and then uh, lab four is actually right here. So I've changed the the number here. But we did the ultrasonic level lab, uh, being five A, well, I guess four A, four B, and four C here. So we went over all these guys. Um, and uh, we did not uh, do the last part with the PID control. Uh, there just wasn't time for that. So um, next, when we come back, we're going to be doing uh, these labs. So up to here uh, is basically what we've covered so far. So I'll drop the review right in between these guys right here. So if you have a chance, watch a couple of those videos, get yourself back up to speed if any of these answers do not make sense. All right, guys, so let's bring up the, uh, the test review here. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody's cool with all of these uh, these different terms as we go through. If you're really screwed up, then you're being more than welcome to text me over the weekend, um, and we can just go over like specific things that are screwing up here. All right, guys. Number one, an open loop system is not self-correcting. Okay, so an open loop system is basically a manually controlled system, right? So for that guy, it's true. Okay, it has no sensor or feedback loop, and I'll try to keep the pace. Like this, so if I've if I've gone a little bit too fast, um, you can always slow it down in uh, in YouTube so that I talk like this, um, uh, or you can just stop it uh, and just go back a little bit to review what I've talked about. But I'll try to keep the pace up at this pace so we can get through this fair in a fairly decent manner. Number two, when a disturbance in the manufacturing process occurs in an open loop system, it's necessary to manually change the command signal to the actuator to maintain the original process control variable. Okay, so this one is an open loop system, right? Let me see if my um, stuff is working. There we go. Okay, so we got an open loop system that's basically a manually controlled uh, system, right? So those two things look like they are the same. So that is true as well. Okay, so number two is true. Number three, in a typical control system, the set point is constantly changing. So just think of this, like do you, like, are you actually going to the thermostat and on like a, like on a half hour basis, are you changing the temperature in the house? No, you're basically keeping it the same, right? So remember that the, the set point, we're, we're gonna be going back to uh, this one, this block diagram is from the Bartelt um, textbook. If you're interested in that, then uh, I'll link it uh, below in the comments section. It's a great textbook. Um, so the set point is coming in to this block diagram right here. Right? And I'm just gonna always be going back to this block diagram. Okay, so for the set point, um, is it constantly changing? No, unless the parameters change, the set point usually remains constant. The only time that the set point would change constantly would be like in a robot, right? You're moving to a different point, so your set point is always changing. Whereas if you have the level in the tank, you want the level in the tank to be a certain amount. You want the temperature in the room to be a certain amount. You're looking for the pressure to be maintained at a certain amount. So the set point is usually being, um, for the most part, staying constant. Number four, the flow of fuel or energy that is altered by the actuator uh, is referred to as the manipulated variable. So what do you think for this one? The flow or fuel of energy that's altered by the actuator. The actuator, remember that the actuator uh, is, well, and I'll say this like three, at least three times over the course of this one, uh, a valve, a motor, or a heater, right? So one of those three things is usually manipulating something. Uh, so this one, the, um, the actuator is right here. The manipulated variable is right here, ultimately 
controlling temperature, pressure, level, or flow. So the answer for that guy is true. You're manipulating that variable in order to ultimately control the pressure, flow, temperature, or pressure. I said that, <laughs> what did I say? Uh, missing one there, I said pressure twice. Uh, level, pressure, flow, temp, or level. <clears throat> Number five, another term commonly used for actuator is the final control element. Uh, so not sure why there's like three or four different names for everything here, uh, but do I have the block diagram? No, let's go back to that block diagram. So the block diagram, the actuator uh, is right here, right? So another name for this guy is the final control element. So not sure why there's three different names for everything, uh, but the thing that you turn on being the valve, the motor, or the heater, that is called the actuator or also called the final control element. So number five is true. What did I say? It's the final element that's receiving the signal from the controller. Okay, and again, just to hammer this in, so I'll probably say the same thing like 15 times over the course of the, uh, but that's all right. So we have a valve a motor or a heater you're going to be turning on one of those guys to manipulate some variable to ultimately control those four things that we talked about temperature pressure pressure level or flow right 99 percent of the time it's going to be a valve i always thought it was a motor right like a pump or something like that uh, but most of the time we're actually opening and closing valves to allow more or less flow to happen within the system there Right. The next thing that we'd be controlling would be a motor, right? Like a pump or a fan, and then finally a, a heater. Uh, so a heater being an electric heater. So you'd be manipulating current to the heater to ultimately to control the temperature. Number six, the measured variable represents the condition of the manipulated variable. Okay, so the measured variable is right here, and we're saying that it looks at the manipulated variable. But there seems to be uh, something in between those two bad boys right there, right? So uh, the manipulated variable is like steam flow, like you're manipulating steam flow to ultimately control temperature, right? The measured variable is what your sensor is looking at, right? So the sensor is actually measuring something. It's not measuring, your sensor is not measuring the steam flow. Your sensor is measuring the temperature, right? The controlled variable. Okay, so the measurement device or the measure variable is looking at our control variable. It's not looking at the manipulated variable. Okay, so have this block diagram out while you're doing the test. This is gonna help you to slowly go through uh, and understand what the words are in each of the questions there. Okay, so this one's false. The measure variable looks at the condition of the process or the control variable. Number seven, open loop system includes a sensor. So hopefully this one's quick and dirty, or quick, quick and dirty, <laughs> quick and easy. An open loop system includes a sensor. No, it's a manual, uh, manually controlled loop, right? A sensor would allow for feedback and an open loop is manually controlled. Quick and dirty, what's on your mind? Number eight, closed loop control systems are self-regulating. So closed loop means that there's actually a sensor and a controller. That would be true. That's the main reason for incorporating a sensor to allow the control loop to manage itself. Number nine, the summing junction or comparator in the closed loop industrial control system subtracts the feedback signal from the set point signal. So hopefully I have the diagram next, the summing junction or the comparator. So that is right here, right? So that's this bad boy right here. Um, just keep in mind that the error detector or the comparator is part of the controller, right? That's part of the, the building automation system, all these acronyms, or the PLC, right? So it's part of the controller. So the question was, uh, the summing junction comparator in the closed loop uh, subtracts the feedback signal from the set point signal. Well, it looks like it's doing that right there, right? So it's taking the difference between the set point and the feedback signal. So that one's true. Right, so the error signal, so whatever error signal we get within the controller would be the difference between the set point and the feedback signal. Right, so any difference between those guys will create an error. And then the, the controller will try to accommodate for that error by sending out a signal out to the actuator. Number nine is true. Number 10, the terms equilibrium and balance are used to describe a system where the control variable is at a state 
specified by the command set point signal. That sounds good. It's true. Right? We're trying to get to an equilibrium. We're trying to have uh, the set point and the feedback signal being exactly the same. Number 11, a load demand change will alter the value of the control process variable. So load demand, like if you think of the number of people in the room, um, as, as you have more or less people in the room and you're trying to control the temperature in that room, the body heat from each of those guys is, is um, you know, either upping the load demand or decreasing the load demand, right? So the number of people in a room, if you have like a hot water tank uh, and you have two kids having a shower at the same time, if you're lucky enough to have two showers, um, then the load demand is going to go up, right? So that one's true. Load demand is like, um, is how much, um, I was going to use demand again, like how many people are actually using the system or how many people are within the room or um, how many portions of your of your system are actually using that uh, that control variable. OK, so there's three things that will change the control variable and we'll, we'll probably mention this a number of times as well. Right. So obviously a change in the set point value. So you change the, the temperature at the thermostat that's going to have an effect on the control variable. Uh, load demand, so how many people are within the house or how large is the house, right? That's your load demand. Uh, and then any disturbances, so opening and closing of a door, right? Or power losses or uh, the furnace isn't working as properly as it, as it normally would, right? So changes in set point definitely going to change the control variable. Load demand is going to have an effect on the control variable. And then any disturbances they didn't put a sensor in to look at are also going to affect your control variable. Number 12, pressure, temperature, level are often controlled by flow. That's true. We said that uh, the most common actuator is the valve, right? So pressure, temperature, and level are usually controlled by the opening and closing of a valve. Number 13, a complex machine in which process variables such as pressure, temperature, level, and flow are manipulated simultaneously, or there exists a separate control loop to regulate each variable. That just means that you have uh, temperature level flow uh, and pressure, right? And you're not going to really mix those signals together. You're going to have a separate two wires for each of those guys. So every pressure, temperature level and flow are going to have a completely separate control loop. You're not going to mix your temperature and your pressure loops together. Okay, so that would be true. You know, I'm just thinking about that. The only time you would have something like that where you'd have two signals coming together would be like flow and you want to know the density of the gas that's flowing. Then you would have a flow sensor, uh, but then tied into it, you'd also have an RTD. But ultimately, coming from that transmitter, that flow transmitter, you would have two wires going back to the, back to the control room. So the RTD may send a signal into the flow, the flow transmitter, um, to accommodate and give you a mass flow reading there. But ultimately from that flow sensor, you would still just have two wires going back to, back to the control loop. Number 14, the hysteresis and linearity of a sensor refer to the same thing. So on your test review, you have that page there of a number of different terms you'll find on a cut sheet to those terms being hysteresis and linearity. linearity. Now hysteresis we've seen in um, in theory class, it usually means like like a magnet holding magnetic field and then releasing that magnetic field. So hysteresis is used predominantly in a number of different places in electrical theory. Uh, but in hysteresis, it means a completely different thing uh, in instrumentation. So uh, hysteresis is uh, a difference between values going up and going down, right? So here we can see uh, that, remember we looked at the current pressure transducer and we looked at the values going from four to 20 and from 20 down to four. And we were looking at any difference in values between uh, going up or going down in current values. Because remember that ultimately that four to 20 was controlling a three to 15 PSI and that was opening and closing a valve. That valve may stick when it's opening or whether it's closing, right? It's a mechanical valve. Uh, so hysteresis is the difference between values increasing or decreasing in value. Linearity is just um, how much does the signal look like a straight line, right? Where we can just take the slope of the line at any point there and get the same slope all the way through. So 
Actually, all of the sensors that we've looked at so far for level have provided us with the linear output. When we get into flow, we'll have an exponential increase in the differential pressure across the DP cell. But so far, we're just looking at uh, the linearity or how much it looks like a straight line. So hysteresis and linearity are two separate things on a cut sheet for a sensor and are obviously two different parameters here. Okay, so the answer is true. Number 16, oh, what was I doing here? Why did I have that picture? Oh, sorry, they're both, sorry, refer to the same thing, false. Okay, I don't must, must have gone ahead, sorry. Off the rails here. Number 15, sensors and transmitters are often combined into one unit. That corresponds to the next picture that I had there. Uh, so that's true, right? So um, when we talked about that RTD, that's a resistance temperature detector, right? It's a piece of platinum wire that's within a duct or a pipe. Um, and we know that it's just a piece of platinum wire. It changes the resistance and causes a very small increase or decrease in voltage. Um, well, that smart, very small increase or decrease in voltage is not a standardized signal. It's not something that every manufacturer can look at, right? And this RTD that we're working on um, may be from uh, Siemens, and we use that with a Honeywell control system, right? So they may have different manufacturers. So there has to be a standardized signal, uh, and that standardized signal is the 4 to 20 milliamp output. So you're always going to have a transmitter uh, incorporated with a sensor, right? The sen the transmitter is going to um, is going to do two things. One, it's going to amplify the signal. Right, because usually we have a disgustingly small change of resistance or voltage, so we have to bump that up. Uh, and then two, it's going to send it out as a standardized signal. <laughs> Can't write fast enough. And that standardized signal is usually a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Remember that there's other digital protocols being HART, Profibus, Profinet, uh, but if we're just talking about analog signals, then it's probably going to be a 4 to 20 milliamp current because we can send that as far as we can, like 1,000 feet, right, without any signal de degradation. So this little, what we call hockey puck, that little transmitter to the top of the RTD, the RTD ties into it, cha changes the, looks at the change of resistance, gives us a, a change in voltage, we amplify that up, right with the 24 volt power supply and then push it out as a standardized signal so quick answer here for 15 is true number 16 an i to p transducer converts a current signal into a proportional voltage output okay so i to p right was that um one that we looked at i think in like week two right so i is for current p is for pressure so this current to pressure transducer, right, where they have I to P, that takes the standard four to 20 milliamp current uh, and changes it to a three to 15 PSI pressure, right? Nothing there mentions anything about voltage. So number 16 is false. Okay, this was the current to pressure transducer, right? So we had this mounted on the side of a larger valve. Um, and so we have the current going in, modulating the 3 to 15 onto the top of the valve, and that pushes down on the diaphragm, which pushes down on the spring, which opens and closes the valve there. So think of the current to pressure transducer as a, a variable solenoid. The solenoid opens and closes depending on how much current we send to it. Okay, and on to the multiple chance questions. Number 17, the output of the measurement device sensor is... So the feedback signal, the measuring, measurement variable, let's see if I have the block diagram next. There we go. So the output of the measurement device, or what we call the sensor, or what is also called the primary element. The engineers like to keep it just so complicated. Three different names for the same thing. Us as electricians, we just want to keep it simple, guys. Uh, but we need to follow the um, the different names, right? So we got primary element, sensor, or measurement device. Not sure why we can't just get along and just decide on one thing. But the output of that guy uh, is our feedback signal there, right? So what the answers were, um, the output of the measurement device is the measure variable or the feedback signal or neither of them. Uh, so the answer there is feedback signal. 
Number 18, an error signal develops when which of the following conditions occurs? Well, usually if it's all the above, it is all the above, right? So remember we said um, that if the set point was changed, that is going to change the control variable. If a disturbance appears, right? Disturbance being uh, the valve isn't working properly. We lost power for a while. Um, a sensor is not calibrated as well as it should. That's a disturbance. Um, or the load demand uh, varies, right? So all of a sudden there's more demand on the system there or less demand on the system, right? So all three of those guys are going to come into play. I will never give you an all of the above uh, answer, um, but I will most likely ask you for all three of these guys, right? So this will probably be one of the fill in the blank questions, right? So in Blackboard, you'll have multiple chance. The Blackboard will mark right away. Uh, then you won't get your final mark um, at the end of the test because I'll have to go through and check that you've put the appropriate answers here. So you can put a star on this bad boy right here. I will definitely ask you to be writing out each of these guys or typing out uh, each of these guys into your test there. Number 19, uh, which one is the difference between the condition of the control variable and the set point? Okay, let's see if I have the block diagram. No, if I didn't drop it in the block, block diagram, that sucks. Um, so the error signal is the difference between those guys, right? So think of this guy um, as like an op amp. So we have the set point and the feedback signal, right? We're comparing those guys uh, and the error signal is any difference between those guys, right? So there's probably some op amp or operational op amplifier where it's looking at the difference between the set point and the feedback and with an operational op amplifier, any difference between those guys provides us with uh, some type of output signal. That output signal being the error signal. So 19 is C. 20, the final control element is positioned from a signal from do I have, I probably didn't put the block diagram, probably have the answer right away. But the final control element was the actuator that was uh, sent a signal from the controller, right? So sorry for not putting the block diagram in there, but we had uh, the controller, right? And that was sending a signal out to the actuator and the actuator, another name for that guy is the final control element. Right, so that guy ultimately controlled our control variable. So you can see that I'm, I'm showing you that we should be able to like quickly just draw out this block diagram, right? That's our sensor. The sensor sends our feedback signal to the comparator, right? And then we have our set point going in here. So you should be able to quickly draw out the, the block diagram there. So the final control element is uh, sent a signal from the controller, the controller being the building automation system or the PLC. 21, which one is an unintentional? I don't have to read anything else. I know that unintentional is a disturbance to the system, right? But we're still reading the example of unintentional factor that caused the condition of the control variable to become different than the set point. Unintentional would be a disturbance to the system. 22, the set point typically remains unchanged uh, in a type of control system. So we said that in a process control system, right? So in, in a process control system, then the set point would be stagnant, right? With a robotics or motion control, then your motion control, you're trying to get the motor to be at a specific speed, right? Uh, or a robot, you're trying to get to a specific point. So your set point's always changing. Whereas process control, um, again, looking at these four, right? Temp, pressure, level, or flow, then the set point's usually con like consistently at a certain value there. 23, if a closed loop system is in a balanced condition or equilibrium, the feedback signal will uh, increase, decrease if the set point changes. So we have no idea. We have no idea what's going on out in the field, right? So it's going to either increase or decrease, right? It looks at that op amp is there and then it really depends on uh, what the feedback signal is saying. Is the, is the feedback signal uh, is it like if your set point is here, right? Is your feedback signal below your set point, right? Or if we have our set point, is it above there, 
right? Or is it oscillating, right? If the set point is here, right, and we've got this happening, right, then we're going above and below the, the set point. So it's going to be adding and subtracting there, trying to accommodate there and trying to, um, to settle it down. Right. Ultimately, uh, when you come back for advanced, we're going to start talking about PIDs, proportional integral derivative algorithms that determine what the output is actually going to be. But it could be either one of them. 24. Which one is the desired value at which the process should be controlled? So the desired value is going to be the set point. Right? That's ultimately where we want the system to be at. 25, which one is the sensing device that detects the condition of the process variable? So the sensing device uh, is going to be the sensor, which is not here. Woo! Which one is the sensor? What's the name? <laughs> Sarah, relax, it's me, it's okay, dude. Sarah, relax. The dog's leaving. Sarah's screaming the answer. She's saying that the sensor is going to be the primary element. Give me two seconds. Let me settle her down. No, she's not settled. Hang on. Hey. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Okay, so sensor is a uh, primary element there. 26. Which one is the difference between the highest and the lowest value in a sensor's calibrator range uh, of measurement? So there's a number of good like answers that look very technical. Bias, accuracy, drift, span. Um, so in there, uh, the difference between the highest and the lowest values of a sensor's calibrated range, that's going to be the span. Remember, that's the full... Um, I'm going to use the, the word range again. That's the full range of values, right? So the span, when we change the span, we're moving the whole range of values for that sensor there. So 26 is span. Remember the two terms that we talked about were zero and span. 27, which one is the closest to which uh, elements provide agreement among measured variables? So this is the one where it, um, on the front page of your, uh, your handout, you have things like accuracy, repeatability, precision, hysteresis, linearity, all those different terms you'd see on a cut sheet. The ones that closest which elements provide agreement among measured variables. Um, so that's going to be repeatability or precision. That just means that every time you take a measurement or repeat a measurement, then it gives you the same value out, right? So um, giving you the same value out doesn't mean that it's accurate. It just means that it's precise, right? So it just means that it's giving you the same output all the time, right? So if we look here, uh, high accuracy, high repeatability would be dead on, on the, right on the bullseye, right? Low accuracy, high repeatability uh, is going to be here. That every time you repeat a, a, a sensor measurement, it's giving you the same value coming out. Doesn't mean that it's accurate whatsoever, but it's very precise, but it's not accurate. Uh, and then low accuracy and low repeatability, this stuff's all over the map. Sensor is just garbage. Right, so um, giving you values all over the map, not accurate and not precise whatsoever. So repeatability and, and precision are the same term there. Okay, so 27 is C. 28, which one is the closest which uh, multiple measurements approximate a straight line on a graph? Okay, straight line on a graph means that it's a linear output, right? So um, that's just saying that as we, like when we were looking at uh, in lab, we had our um, our level and we went from 10 centimeters to 50 centimeters, right? Uh, and we had in, in the lab, we had a zero to five volt uh, DC output. And we ended up having a linear relationship uh, so that um, at 50%, right? So 50% uh, of this being 30 centimeters at our 50% mark, that was giving us two and a half volts DC out. So nice linear relationship there. 29, which one is this, the term to describe as repeatability? So remember we said that every time you repeat a sensor measurement, it gives you the same answer or same value. That means that it's precise. Doesn't mean that it's accurate, just means that it's precise. So repeatability and precision are the same thing. 30, a sensor has uh, excellent or poor sensitivity if its characteristic curve, which shows its operation, has a dead space. 
So dead space is like where the sensor just craps out, like everything's good in the bottom or the top end of the range or maybe in the middle, it just goes off the rails and doesn't give you the appropriate values. Or a valve, a valve is opening nicely and then all of a sudden gets stuck and then you know kind of has this dead band there. It's, dead band's more so uh, for sensors, uh, but it's just a, an area where you're not getting the right values, right? So it's just kind of all over the map there. So you're looking for a nice linear output, but you're not getting that output at that point there. Okay, so it's obviously a poor sensitivity if the characteristic curve has a dead space. If it's within the parameters of the sensor, it's fine. If it's not, then you're going to have to replace the sensor. 31, which one is a set of rules that determines the format and transmission method of a digital data transmission? So digital data uh, transmission, the name for that uh, was protocol. Right? And we said that there's a number of different protocols that are out there. They're all fighting for market share. Heart, Profibus, Profinet, Modbus, DeviceNet, all those guys are just basically different manufacturers that are trying to fight within industry for market share. One not being better than the other. Um, it's just different digital protocols. Different digital protocols meaning that instead of just the, um, the 4 to 20, you can have a bunch of 1s and zeros. Um, Uh, and you've got um, different packets of information, right? So one packet is going to give you um, the location of the unit. Then the next one is actually going to give you the sensor value, right? So with the 4 to 20, all we get is the sensor value. We don't know where the location is, right? Uh, or what's called the address, right? So if you want to have an addressable system, like a fire alarm system, you need to have the location and the sensor value. Um, and you need to have the sensor diagnostics. So if let's think about fire alarm. Uh, if you have uh, just a standard fire alarm system where you just have an end line resistor, that's the same as having a four to 20. All you can do is just look for a trouble or an open, right, or an alarm. You can't tell where the, the, fire alarm, the fire alarm smoke detector is. You don't have the location. And you don't know whether the fire alarm detector is dirty or not. right? So with an addressable system um, for sensors and stuff like that, you would get the 4 to 20 milliamp output. right? So you'd get the, the value for the sensor corresponding to what we had before. But then you'd also get the location in the plant. And then you get some diagnostics as well. Is that sensor working properly? Is that valve working properly? Right. So the, these digital protocols give us a lot more information than the 4 to 20. And that's where everything's going towards. The 4 to 20 is basically um, antiquated now, right? Because you need to have all of this information coming back to the controller so you can have a better understanding of what's going on in the plant. 32, in batch production applications, uh, which ones are the most common process variables that are going to be regulated to control the rate of reaction? So which ones do you think would be the most commonly controlled? Level of flow, level of pressure, temperature and pressure, or level and temperature. So the one that's actually used the most, or the two that are used the most, would be level and, uh, sorry, level. What am I smoking today? Temperature and, uh, and pressure. So the two that are... Uh, being controlled the most are temperature and pressure. 33, the most common variable that in a continuous process application that needs to be controlled. Okay, so the most commonly is temperature and pressure, right? Uh, and so the one thing that's usually controlled the most is a valve. Uh, and so flow is our main thing that we're going to be controlling with that valve. Okay, so the valve is ultimately controlling the temperature and pressure, right? And we're controlling the flow of steam flow or, you know, air through a duct or something like that. 34, which one converts the output of a sensor into a standardized signal? Okay, so another name for sensor is transducer. Okay, so that takes care of this guy. It's not B, right? It's neither... A or B, uh, so it's a transmitter. So transducer is a, is a term for a sensor, uh, and a sensor or transducer uh, changes one energy into another. Or one type of energy into another. 
Okay, so the term transduce, transducer is for a sensor. The transmitter is the one that sends it out as a standardized signal. And again, standardized signal being the 4 to 20 milliamps DC. 34 is transmitter. 35, um, donkey. 35, when how much milliamps is applied to the direct acting control val uh, valve, it should be completely uh, closed. So remember this corresponds to the current to pressure uh, transducer, right? So four milliamps uh, is the value that corresponds to three PSI, right? Being this, the lowest pressure there. So lowest current, lowest pressure, the valve is most likely closed. If we had 20 milliamps, then we'd have 15 PSI applied to the valve and the valve would be open, right? Being a direct acting control valve. 36, uh, which process typically manufactures a greater quantity of product? So we talked about batch versus continuous. So batch would be like at a soft drink factory, right? You're making a batch of soft drinks, whereas continuous would be um, like a glass factory. You're continuously making the glass or continuous better example would be um, a, uh, a wastewater treatment plant, right? You're continuously working on the wastewater or uh, energy protection would be continuous, right? So obviously the continuous is working 24 seven. And so that one's gonna be giving us the greater output there. 37, which process variable should primarily be monitored to prevent the heating element of a boiler becoming too hot and becoming damaged? Okay, so the, the heating element is ultimately gonna control the temperature, uh, but in order to watch for that heating element from uh, burning out, we need to control the level. We need to have it always immersed in the water so it can create the steam there. So we're always looking at the level being maintained so that the level doesn't go below the element. 38, uh, standard current or voltage signals are capable of being transmitted a greater distance. So we've said this about 20 times already. The current signal is the one that's going to go longer, right? On a, on a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, you have a, like a series circuit, right? So if you have 16 milliamps at the beginning of the circuit, you're going to have 16 milliamps at the end of the circuit. There's definitely a resistance on the wire, and there's going to be a voltage drop across that wire, but the current will remain the same in a series circuit. Whereas if you had a voltage signal, then again, you're gonna have a voltage drop from the sensor to the control room. And if that voltage drop was there, then it's going to affect our signal. So the four to 20 is usually a series circuit. And in a series circuit, the current remains identical all the way through. So you can basically do like 500 to 1000 feet run of four to 20. And as long as your power supply is large enough to push that current, you'll still have the same current at the control room that you would have at the sensor. 39, an open loop system does not have, so controller, final control element, feedback loop, all the above. I would say feedback loop, right? It doesn't have a sensor, right? So the main thing that is missing is a sensor, right? Open loop system is just a manually controlled system. 40, the primary element. So let's see if you guys remember what this is. Primary element is like the first thing in the loop. And so the name for that guy is a sensor. Okay, so all different types of names. Transducer, sensor, primary element, um, measurement device, right? So all of those things correspond to the primary element. Primary element is the sensor. The final control element. That's the last thing in the line, right? So we send a signal out to the field and we send the signal out to what's called the control valve or the actuator, right? So remember that final control element, another name for that guy is an actuator and it's a valve, a motor, or a heater. 42, the manipulated variable primarily used to control temperature in a boiler so we're manipulating liquid temperature, pressure, or steam flow. We are manipulating steam flow to ultimately control temperature. Okay, that's the manipulative variable usually screws everybody up and it's a little bit, um, it's just confusing, right? What is the manipulative variable? Ultimately, you are manipulating something in order to control something. So we're manipulating steam flow to ultimately control the temperature out of the boiler. Okay, then we get some completion questions here. Uh, which one is sent to the final control element? Uh, the measurement, measured variable, 
No, feedback signal, that's the final, so the final control element was the actuator out in the field, right? The valve, the motor, or the heater. Uh, error signal, no, the control signal was the one that was sent out to the field there. 44, standard pneumatic transmission signals. So that is the air signal that we send to a larger valve to open and close it. And so the range there was three to 15 PSI, right? Three corresponding to the zero and 15 corresponding to the span. Okay, when a four to 20 electronic transmitter is being calibrated, the current produces when the span adjustment is made so remember the span is the the full range of values uh, but ultimately we're controlling the top end of the range right so the top end of the range of a 4 to 20 milliamp current is 20 milliamps right so again this one would correspond to the zero potentiometer and the 20 would control would correspond to the span 46 standard electronic current transmission signals range from so remember that within the test the answer might be on the previous question, right? So this guy is four to 20. Okay, so look at the diagrams, look at the whole test as a whole. If something's screwing you up, circle it, move on to the next question, and then maybe later on in the, in the test, then the answer would become apparent. 47, which one of the type of transmission that is used in applications where a spark uh, may cause an explosion? Okay, so it says pneumatic, um, but it's, we're, that's old school. Um, and I just haven't uh, fixed or deleted or omitted question 47. Um, so you can just basically omit this, right? You're not gonna have a pneumatic signal going into an explosive area. Uh, we're gonna talk about intrinsic safety. So what types of signals do you send out to an explosive environment? You can send four to 20 milliamps into an explosive environment, but you have to make use of uh, an intrinsically safe circuit. Uh, so it's basically a bunch of Zener diodes, resistors, and a few fast acting fuse. Uh, but as long as we limit the current and voltage in an explosive environment, we can limit or we can stop an explosion from happening. So you can just sit, hit omit on 47. 48, when a pneumatic transmitter is being calibrated, the pressure it produces when it's being zeroed. So zero is the low end of the range. It's a three to 15 PSI range. And so the low end is gonna be three PSI. 49, okay, bunch of calculations here. If the level in a tank is at 36% of the range of the minimum level to maximum level, the current signal to correspond with this level is gonna be how many milliamps? Now you have to, excuse me, I used red here to put the answers here. But the answer is going to be 9.76 milliamps. Okay, so the reason for that is that we have a range of four to 20. Four to 20 does not reference zero. Right, so we have 36% of the range, right? So 36%, that's a percentage that goes from zero to 100. So we have to have a range that goes from zero to some value. So we have to drop this range, four to 20, down by four. So all the values, four goes to zero, 20 goes to 16, right? So 36% on a range that actually references zero, being zero to 16, where did I get the 16? there's 16 equal values between 20 and four, right? So um, we have a value of 5.76. How did I get the 5.76? I took 0.36, which is 36%. I multiplied that by my zero to 16 range, and that gives me 5.76. But that's not my final answer. It's 5.76 if my signal is from zero to 16. My signal is not on a zero to 16 range, it's on a four to 20. So we're gonna bump all these values up by four. So I'm gonna take the 5.76 plus my elevated zero of four to give me 9.76 milliamps. So hopefully you were cool with this answer. If you put 5.76, don't forget to put, uh, to add the elevated zero of four. Okay, so answer is 9.764, uh, 49. Okay, don't give me 10, don't round up to 10. I want two decimal places there, okay? I also don't want 10 decimal places. I just want two. Okay, 50, what percentage would a pneumatic valve calibrated for three to 15 be if, it, if a nine PSI signal is uh, applied to the valve? Okay, so nine PSI, we, now we're going backwards, opposite of the previous question, right? So we have nine PSI, but it's on a three to 15 range, right? So it's nine PSI on a three to 15 range. 
that range does not start at zero. So I can't just take nine divided by 15 and get the answer. I need to reduce this range down to zero so that we actually have a range that starts at zero to correspond to a zero to 100%. In order to do that, I took three off of every value here. So nine PSI on a three to 15 range is the same as six PSI on a zero to 12 range. So six divided by 12 gives me 50% of the range. Okay, so hopefully you're good on the previous question, taking a value and seeing what the percentage is, and then now giving a, given a percentage and seeing what the value is. So same steps going one way or the other. Okay, I find this is the easiest way to, to do it, but you may have a different way that works for you. Stick with whatever way that works for you. 51, but what percentage of a chart recorder calibrated for a one to five volt signal range will show if the voltage it receives is three volts? Okay, remember that we are still using a signal that starts at one. We have an elevated zero there on the one to five volt range. Okay, the question is, what percentage are we gonna get out? Okay, so it's three volts, but it's three volts on a one to five volt scale. Can't just take three divided by five and get the percentage because that range does not start at zero. So we have to drop that range down to a value that starts at zero, right? There are four equal values between one and five. So three volts on a one to five volt scale is the same as two volts on a zero to four volt scale. Again, that gives us 50% of the range. Two divided by four giving us 50%. Okay, hopefully you're solid on these questions. I'm definitely gonna give you like three or four of these questions as we go through. 52, a current depressure transducer is calibrated to provide a 315 output for a corresponding four to 20 milliamp input. What will the pressure output signal be if nine uh, milliamp input signal is sent to the transducer? So this is one going from one set of values to another or one range to another. In this case, when you're going from one range to another, the ratio stays the same between the three to 15 and the four to 20. So in this case, this is one of those examples where we can use cross multiplication. So we have nine milliamps out of a total of 20. We want to know how much that is out of our total of 15 PSI. Remember that the ratio stays the same. So on the previous ones, we had to use the, the graphs or the bar charts and go back and forth, right? We could do that with this, but this would take forever. So because the ratio stays the same, then the ratio between this and this is the same, so we can use cross multiplication. Nine out of a total of 20 gives me how much out of a total of 15? Cross multiplication, we have 20x is equal to nine times 15. Take the 20 over, x is equal to nine times 15 divided by the 20, giving me 6.75 PSI. Okay, if you wanted to take that next step, um, then the nine milliamps is gonna to correspond to 31.25% of the range. Okay, hopefully you're good with this one. I guarantee I'm gonna give you uh, a very similar value. I'm just, question, I'm just gonna change the milliamp value here. Okay, and again, I'm looking for two decimal places here. Fifty-three. A current depressure transducer calibrated to provide a three to fifteen output with the corresponding four to twenty. Exactly the same question as before. Uh, the pressure output signal if a sixteen milliamp signal. Now sixteen is higher at the higher end of the range, right? So sixteen is going to give you a much closer value to fifteen, right? The ratio stays the same. So in this case, sixteen out of a maximum of twenty gives you how much out of a maximum of fifteen? Cross multiply, 20x is equal to 16 times 15. X is equal to 16 times 15 divided by 20. Final answer is 12 PSI. Okay, if you wanna take that next step to practice finding how much 12 PSI is in a percentage um, or how much 16 milliamps is, that's 75% of the range. Okay, but before you start, think this through, right? 16 milliamps is at the higher end of the range, right? So if you find a value that's like 33% of the range, then you must have screwed up the math there. Okay, so try and think of what what rate, what percentage you're gonna get uh, for your final answer before you start doing this. Okay, hopefully you're cool with these guys. I guarantee you I'm giving you one of these questions. 54, a four to 20 milliamp signal is being converted to a one to five volt signal. How do you do that? So remember that we have four to 20, and when we did the ultrasonic sensor lab, we took the 4 to 20, we put it through a 250 ohm resistor, right? So the answer here 
um, is just cross multiplication, right? We have one signal and another, but remember that the, the way that you do this is you have four to 20 milliamps being pumped through a precision 250 ohm resistor. And that through Ohm's law gives you a one to five volt DC output signal. So it's a quick and dirty way to, uh, to change a current signal into a voltage signal. Okay, the two are, have the same ratio again. So we have 12 out of a maximum of 20, and we wanna know how much that is out of a maximum of five. Cross multiplication there, 20X is equal to 12 times five. X is equal to 12 times five divided by 20, gives us three volts. And if you take it that next step, uh, I'm not asking you for that, but you could take it the next step, and the 12 milliamps or the three volts is gonna be 50% of either of the ranges there. Okay, hopefully everybody's cool with these guys. 55, finishing off, match the type of industrial process that's used in the following manufacturing example, uh, application examples, motion control, batch, and continuous, making paper from wood pulp, robot welding on an automobile frame, and mixing ingredients in a soft drink factory. Okay, so mixing ingredients on a soft drink factory would be a batch. Making paper from wood pulp would be a continuous process. And then a robot welding on an autom automobile frame would be an example of motion control. 56, match the following comparisons of the human body to the elements of the closed loop control system. Actuator, controller, measurement device or sensor uh, being either the muscle, the eyes or the brains behind the operation there. Okay, well, the actuator is gonna be the muscle, right? The thing that actually does work. The controller is gonna be the brains of the operation and the transducer sensor measurement device that's going to be the eyes on the prize right so that's going to be seeing what's going on out in the field there 57 match the description of each step used in the calibration process for the process, proper sequence of steps so we've got like an application that we're looking at and then we've got a sensor that we need to to purchase and then uh, then we need to do the zero and span calibration so what I needed to do is put these guys in order, A, B, C, D, and E. So pause the video for two seconds, write down your answer here, if you haven't already done that, and then we'll go through it. So the answer here is that the first one is, uh, we're gonna determine the full range of variable being measured. So we wanna look at the temperature range being measured, or we wanna look at the pressure range that's being measured, or we wanna see what level we're looking at, or what amount of flow that we're looking at. So we need a, a, a sensor that looks at a specific range of values, okay? Second thing is we're gonna select an appropriate sensor for the application, then determine the type of analog output signal produced by its transmitter. So working uh, with the engineers, with the suppliers, we're gonna select an appropriate sensor, right? So engineers and suppliers usually have, um, you know, specific sensors that they like to use for specific applications within the range that you determined on number one, okay? Number three, they purchase, they put the purchase order out for that unit, right? Um, and then that unit is bench calibrated, right? So somebody st sits at the desk and bench calibrates it for the range that you're looking at. So it already comes to you already pre-configured. You just have to tweak the values when it gets out in the field, right? So once you've installed or the fitters have installed that, that sensor, then you're going to make a zero adjustment, which causes the minimum analog output of the transmitter to be generated with the minimum value of the variable is measured. So we make a zero adjustment. Then the next thing we do is we make a span adjustment, right? So we make a span adjustment, which causes the maximum output of this transmitter to be generated with the maximum value of the measured va variable is measured. So zero, then span, then probably zero span, zero span, right? Three times. Then we check a number of different values. So verify that the zero and span adjustments are accurately accurate when the minimum and maximum values of the variable are measured. You really, you'd be looking at five different values, right? Zero, 25, 50, 75%, and 100. And then you'd look for hysteresis. You look for the values going up in values and going down in values as well. So determine the full range, purchase a sensor. Sensor is purchased, shipped out to you, installed, you make a zero adjustment, make a span adjustment, you make a zero adjustment, you make a span, zero span, then you think it's calibrated, then you do a five-step uh, test.
test on that unit before you walk away and sign off to say that it's totally cool and it's totally calibrated. All right, guys, that's everything for uh, today. That was a long one. I don't know how long that is. I don't have a timing uh, here, but uh, that was a long review. So thanks for sticking, uh, sticking with me. Um, Hopefully everything makes sense. If it doesn't, then you're going to uh, text me over the weekend and just say that the one thing just doesn't make sense and we can go over it uh, together. Make sure you go back over those uh, those YouTube uh, videos. So remember going to the playlist here. If you haven't, go through these guys if anything's screwing you up. Uh, we, in our case, we were not able to do the DP open level tank uh, lab. So have a look at that video. Uh, and then hopefully everything's cool for your test for next week. All right, guys, thanks very much. Uh, if you don't have, I failed to mention this, but if you don't have a copy of this test, uh, then it's obviously linked in the comment section below. All right, guys, thanks very much. We'll see you soon.